I'm Trevor McCandless with Fusion CPA, and today we're covering accounting and tax planning topics as they relate to closing out the year. Um, personally, I have a ton of fun with these topics um, because really they're so positively impactful in our clients' lives and helping to put more money um, in our pockets as entrepreneurs. And let's face it, that's a big reason why we're entrepreneurs. Uh, so for some background, I lead a team of brilliant CPAs over at Fusion CPA, um, and we are technology forward tax accounting and advisory firm um, and we specialize in serial entrepreneurs uh, I started the firm in 2011 and fusion CPA was recently listed as the only CPA firm in the Gator 100 um, which was uh, the fastest growing University of Florida alumni uh, companies so we're super proud of that um, we're gonna dive into the three phases of keeping everything connected today um, and that is kind of our thing when we talk about tax and accounting and how we uh, translate all the uh, compliance that is going on in this world to positively infect our clients. Um, I'll give a quick disclaimer. We always have to do it. We're covering uh, a lot of tax and accounting principles at a high level um, and that while we're also CPAs here at my firm, um, uh, you want to engage your own CPA or us to give you custom advice for your specific situation. Um, so that being said, let's dive into it. I got a couple slides that I'm going to help us guide along here. So let me share my screen. Uh, we should be all good there. So that being said, uh, let's dive into it. So this slide we're looking at uh, describes the three phases of keeping everything connected. So as I said, uh, accounting and tax planning topics as they relate to closing out the year uh, within these three phases. Uh, the first phase we're going to refer or we refer to as stabilization phase. We discuss common action items for closing out the books at year end. Uh, the second phase we refer to as the analysis phase, and we'll discuss some common topics around you know what qualified tax deductions are. That's a common question. We'll also discuss commercial real estate or rather um, depreciation for commercial properties in light of all the tax reform that's happened uh, recently and uh, that depreciation it applies to a lot of different industries but specifically uh, commercial real estate um, and then we'll finally touch on uh, some methods of how to estimate and budget for tax liabilities including quarterly tax uh, calculations um, and then finally in the third phase uh, we, we refer to it as the growth phase, and we'll discuss looking into 2020 and 2021, and we'll talk through an example of, uh, of diving deeper into your numbers for ways to you know, generate more excess cash flow. Uh, so with that, let's dive into the first phase. And so here, uh, you know, stabilization phase. What records should we update uh, and keep updated at the end of the year? You know, bank and credit card accounts, escrow accounts, and loan payments um, are really the kind of the big three here. So we're going to try to focus on those. So let's start with bank and credit card accounts. You know, reconciling and including all the transaction from your entities, bank and credit card accounts, or your properties, bank and credit card accounts is absolutely mandatory to the accuracy of everything that we're doing. It all kinds of starts in this first phase. Um, so if you aren't the one managing your accounting or QuickBooks files, you may not really have an idea of how to check this, check the reconciliations are actually happening. Um, and it's an accounting term and, and some people that are not in the kind of accounting world are kind of like, uh, I don't even know what that means, reconciliation. Um, but that's common for some owners. So first, all owners should at least have access to your QuickBooks files. Um, even if your internal team is not doing the day-to-day -day data entry, it's super common uh, for it to be outsourced. We do a ton of outsourcing, um, but you need to have access to your, to your QuickBooks files. So the action item here is for you as the owner or whoever your financial, let's call it share or lead within your team is, to go ahead and log in and run a balance sheet report within QuickBooks. Books. Um, you can you can, it, it can be as simple simple as just eyeballing initially the balances for each of the bank accounts and credit card accounts, and then comparing that to the balance sheet. 
right? So we have our statement, say Bank of America. We take a look at the 1231 Bank of America statement. It says $10,000. I run a balance sheet report, and I see, okay, this Bank of America account, is it 10000 Is it 15000 Is it 5000 If there are differences, we got you need to start asking some questions of your accountant or whoever's managing the QuickBooks um, file and, you know, ask why the heck are these, uh, why, why the heck are there differences? Um, if you're not, or if you're managing it yourself, you're going to want to call us. Um, you might have an issue. Um, sometimes it's small. Sometimes it could be big. Um, but, you know, fortunately, this might be a short-term issue that can be fixed. We just got to roll up our sleeves and kind of get to work. Uh, the errors typically can be solved by, you know, correcting the accounts for missing transactions. There could be double-counted transactions sometimes, whether it's Amex or Bank of America. There might be some 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 kind of misimporting from that data flow um, and and th it just has to be cleaned up. Or there could be simply misclassified transactions. Uh, you know, escrow accounts are very similar to checking and credit card accounts. Um, what I would add here is to compare these escrow accounts, and they can be used, escrow accounts can be used for so many different things, whether it's in commercial real estate, whether it's a law firm, whether it's an ad or marketing agency. Um, but you want to compare these escrow accounts to the contracts that you have in place with your clients or the closing statements that if you're in, in real estate um, that you have for properties you may have closed on, whatever you're using those accounts for, you need to go back to the legal documents um, and the documents that you have in, um, with each of your clients that make up the balances of this account and double check. If you're delegating this reconciliation step for the escrow account to someone internally who really hates reading contracts, um, especially legal contracts, you're likely going to find errors and um and if you're not kind of overseeing that process you may never even know about them because you know a lot of different reasons um, so we'll just leave it at that um loan payment reconciliations you'd be you'd be surprised how often we see this screwed up the action item here is for your team uh to take a look at the amortization schedules that you have on hand uh and compare them to the financial statements pretty easy, but let me walk you through it. First, you're going to make sure that the debt balances as reported on the balance sheet, we already ran that report earlier when we were looking at the checking accounts, match the debt balances on your year-end lending statements, whether it's a mortgage statement or a line of credit, etc., as well as the amortization schedule or table. Uh, so you might want to jot that down or come back to this piece of the video. Uh, so second, we want to confirm the interest deductions on your income statement. That's a separate report within QuickBooks that we'd want to run and make sure that that interest deduction, interest expense deduction payment on the year end mortgage statement matches your income statement as well as the amortization schedule. So you kind of have a triple reconciliation going on there because each of these can cause, we can see errors if they don't match. And so a couple examples um, when where we see misreporting is like number one, when we see accountants or owners trying to deduct the, maybe the entire mortgage payment. Um, and this is a really common within do-it-yourselfers. It's not the, the principal payment and the interest payment isn't being broken out. Um, so that's one kind of area when we see the entire, you know, debt payment being um, trying to be deducted. Another big one is when we see uh, maybe the entire loan payment be treated as a distribution. And a distribution is an equity, a return of equity, and that's a non-deductible item. But in fact, we know that interest expense payments are deductible, so we might have to do an adjustment there. The third one is um, when there might be some kind of mid-year change, say, to the accuracy of the amortization schedule. And this can happen if a payment was missed or simply terms were renegotiated on interest rates or principal payments. Um, there could have been some debt forgiveness. So that's that's a big reason why when we think of, hey, get the amortization schedule, get the loan documents, that you want to do that kind of double check. So in this light, phase one, the stabilization phase um, can be very smooth. Um, I think a lot of it really depends on how you're
managing the accounting if you're doing it yourself or you have um, another CPA kind of overseeing this on an ongoing basis for you. Um, the do-it-yourself method, we find a lot more errors, as you can imagine, but, you know, it is what it is. So let's dive in the second phase. Okay. So I said it at the beginning of our kind of conversation, phase two in this analysis phase is completely dependent on the accuracy of our stabilization phase in phase one. So for most of our clients, we're handling the adjusting journal entries and the recon reconciliations within all these checking accounts, et cetera, uh, that we mentioned. But we do have clients that have a you know high quality internal accountants that we can coordinate with to review these items. So in part one of this section, um, of the phase two section, we're just gonna call it uh, year end planning. And I wanna touch on qualified tax deductions specifically, as well as depreciation. Um, and with the tax reform, bonus depreciation in section 179 depreciation have taken on new light. So I think it's important to kind of discuss here. So that being said, qualified tax deductions. Common question that we get is what can I deduct? What is a qualified business deduction? So the IRS defines qualified deductible expenses as ordinary and necessary expenses that are incurred in the carrying on of your business. Um, a lot of times people are still kind of shaking their head and saying, well, what does that mean? And so that can raise more questions. So, so you want to dive a little bit deeper into what ordinary and necessary means. I commonly think of ordinary expenses as those that are helping to further the growth and sustainability of your venture. For example, paying for real estate taxes on your commercial property is going to help you sustain ownership in that property. Paying your vendors and employees are necessary to running your business. So lots of boxes kind of checked here in that. Like what, what likely does not qualify is maybe the vacation you're going to take to Italy for Christmas that has no business purpose, right? Um, so a couple things to, talk, to just touch on there on, on qualified expenses. So let's, let's move into depreciation, and this is a little bit more meaty, and we're going to get slightly technical um, for a moment, um, as sometimes depreciation for some industries like maybe law firms, accounting firms, marketing agencies, et cetera, isn't as much of a big deal as it is for more capital intensive industries such as commercial real estate or restaurants, et cetera. So I am sure most of you heard of cost segregation studies. Um, we mostly speak about those for newly built properties or new acquisitions. Um, while these can be costly, um, these studies may very well be worth it. Sometimes they're not even necessary um, to have that actual study done, and we can break out the depreciation differences um, on our own. So the goal in a cost depreciation, cost segregation depreciation study is to identify and separate the assets that have been acquired in a transaction that may be able to be depreciated over shorter time frames than the entire purchase price or the entire building, right? So for example, if we acquire property for a million dollars, we might be able to, we may be able to identify $50,000 of carpeting that may be able to depreciate it and deducted over five years versus 39 years. So what this achieves is the ability to speed up deductions and further reduce taxable income in the current year versus later years. And at the time, and with the time value of money, you know, it says dollar for dollar, we'd rather save the money now versus later if all else is held equal because we can do more, whether we're just like, you know, uh, earning interest and dividends even now between next year, that's a simple example of dollar for dollar time value of money savings. So it should be noted that sometimes owners should not want to speed up deductions. Um, if you have other properties or businesses that are generating losses in these early years and not much taxable income, then why deduct it now when our tax rates are super low versus later years when our tax rates might be super high? So it's a big conversation that you want to kind of have. 
So that being said, if we have significant positive net income, let's look at how we can kind of speed it up. So with the 2017 tax reform and through 2020, we have a new what's called 100% 100% bonus depreciation on eligible. This is like put it in all caps, right? Eligible assets on acquisitions new construction, renovation, whereas this used to be a 50% bonus depreciation. This is pretty significant. Now, there are limitations. I'll talk about that later. But um, and note that that 100% bonus depreciation, it, it goes down marginally um, in the years of 2023 through 2026. But for now, in the short term, um, you can think of it as 100% bonus. So, and, and again, I, I got to emphasize that it's on eligible assets, right? So, if we can identify tangible property, like I mentioned carpeting before, that could be say five year um, assets like carpeting, wallpaper, interior glass, cabinets that are built in, a sink in the break room, these are eligible for this bonus depreciation. Okay, now there's also land improvements. These are traditionally 15 year property. Now note that for purposes of depreciation, I know we're getting technical, but I'm going to just I'm going to get technical with you for a second. This differs from building improvements, which I'll talk about in just a sec. So land improvements um, also are uh, eligible for this 100% bonus depreciation. This is things like that you see outside of a building, landscaping, signage, parking lots, sidewalks, these are all eligible. Uh, now, for building improvements, this is a, a hiccup in the tax reform documents that were written. They were kind of rushed. They were not eligible for bonus, but they are eligible for what's called Section 179 depreciation, which essentially achieves the same thing, fortunately. Um, note that Section 179 has some specific other rules. There's caveats within, within a lot of tax law, um, but we don't always want to go and take Section 179 deduction because if, if, if we're in a loss here or we have very little net income, let's, let's do an example. So if I have $20,000 in net income, but I have a $50,000 worth of carpet, I might not want to do 179 because 179 is limited to my profitability. So I would only be able to take $20,000 of, of of depreciation in the current year, and that would take my net income to zero, but I wouldn't be able to achieve a loss. A Section 179 deduction cannot generate a loss, whereas bonus depreciation can. So kind of funky there, but that's what's uh, that's what's going on. So that being said, I mean I could I could ramble about that topic for a while. Um, so let's dive into part two of how to calculate your estimated tax liabilities. Okay, so here we're going to discuss tax budgeting and how to quickly estimate your tax liability. But first, and I tend to do this from time to time, I want to go on a slight tangent about the differences between net income for which your taxes are based off of and cash flow. Because quite frequently, entrepreneurs confuse the two when thinking about how much taxes they may owe or not owe. So in commercial real estate versus, say, other professional services companies like accounting and law, the differences between net income and cash flow are far greater. Um, for commercial real estate owners, for example, depreciation is much bigger, has a much bigger effect because of all the capital-intensive um, assets that you have to acquire. So, for example, if we have $100,000 of cash on hand, we may only have $20,000 of net income for which we're being taxed on due to depreciation, which is what we call a paper deduction because depreciation isn't actually cash coming out of your pocket. Remember when we kind of gave that example earlier of depreciation between a potential five-year asset and a 39-year asset, it's something that's being deducted over time and it's a paper deduction. It's not actually cash coming out of your pocket because it's already been paid for in year one. Kind of funky, but that's how it works. So in a similar manner, loans and debt are also, or also create similar differences between net income and cash flow. So, for example, when a loan is being paid off in any given year, you may have $100,000 in net income, but 
$20,000 of cash on hand. But in this case, you're being taxed $100,000, right? Because you paid off $80,000 of a loan, bringing your cash down to a to down, down to 20k. So I just want to beat it home that cash on hand and cash flow is very different than net income and what you're being taxed on. So that being said, I went on my tangent. I always do it. Um, so let's chat. Let's chat about how to estimate your you know, proactively estimate your tax liability in any given year. And I kind of think about it in two different methods. There's a more complex method and there's a very simple method. Um, the more complex method, but is which is definitely uh, most times the most accurate, um, we're essentially proactively preparing, I mean, a full tax return with all of the information that we have for the coming years. Say we're, you know, if we're in 2020, it's going to be in 2020. If it's in 2021, it's going to be in 2021. Um, most of the time, your CPA is going to do this for you, and it's not going to slow you down at all. It's just kind of work that's going on behind the scenes. So, for example, if it's June of 2020, and we want to actually know what our 2020 tax liability is looking like, we're going to roll over all of the information that we know of from 2019, and then we're going to edit any changes from 2019, from investments, sources of income, expenses, and then we're going to add in any kind of 2020 new sources of income or new acquisitions or new disposals, anything new that changed from the prior year. So in this example, we're doing it in June with some assumptions, of course, of, of also what's going to happen over the next six months or seven months, whatever it's going to be. And we're commonly going to have large swings between now and what we anticipate. You know, we're making an assumption that things are going to happen in the next six months. That might actually not happen. It might happen. It, it, it might be smaller or bigger, who knows. Um, but this can be edited at any given time, and that's why the IRS says these are estimated quarterly tax payments for entrepreneurs. They're estimates. You know, it's it's a kind of our best guess on actual performance. Um, but we can get close and edit them at the end of each quarter if we like. So that's the more complex method. We do a ton of that. Um, in the more simplified um, method, we're not preparing essentially a whole tax return and doing a whole projection. Uh, this is best used, in my opinion, if there are just very little, very little to no changes in the amounts and sources of income of your companies or properties from the prior year. So in this scenario, you could actually simply look at, and I'm going to say this with, in any given year, say from 2019 to 2020 or 2020 to 2021, that the tax rates are not really changing very much. Um, that This is in a post-tax reform kind of tax environment, um, not in a pre and post. <laughs> I won't get too complicated on that. Um, so all things being held equal. So in this, in this scenario, you can simply look at your prior tax return and divide your taxable income by your total tax calculation and you'll come to what's called an effective or average tax rate across all the marginal tax brackets. So if you're looking at your 2019 tax form, and I know I'm getting technical again, but you know, bear with me. If you're looking at the, the 2019, 2019 tax forms, you can find the taxable income amount on line 11B of page one of the form 1040, okay? And then the total tax amount can be found on page two of the form 1040 on line 16. Okay, you can pause the video if you want to right there and rewind it and go look at your tax returns. This is more do-it-yourself for method or if you just need just to get a quick calculation of how much to budget for. So then boom, you're done. You've estimated your tax liabilities or we have. Um, best practice note, after you've, you've kind of established and calculated what that tax liability is going to be, we commonly like to recommend moving these funds into a separate checking account that is kind of out of sight, out of mind, so you don't go spending your tax budget. Um, tough to do, especially when we're in growth mode, um, and we could use that money to make more money. Um, so it's a conversation that you would want to have with us um, to figure out what, what the right balance is there. Um, FYI, we come and get this question. You can easily find the stuff on Google as well. Um, but what are those dates these estimated uh, quarterly taxes amount uh, due are? April 15th, 
June 15th, September 15th, and January 15th. Um, so those are the dates. Good to put them in your calendar. So at this point, we've covered stabilizing and analyzing in the first two phases. Uh, so now it's time to kind of go into the third phase of using the data that we have that has kind of done the planning in the stabilization phase and historical work. Now let's look forward to see how we can make more money and maximize cash flow. So with that, I think it's best here to share kind of a story of what we recently did with a client. And the client that I'm thinking of, he came to us, he's actually in the mortgage refinancing business, and he he kind of called me frantically not too long ago and super stressed. Um, as he put it, he felt like he was swapping dollars. In other words, cash was coming in and going right back out. He said, Trevor, man, I'm a sales guy. I know how to close the deal. And then I'm on to the next. I don't know what these numbers mean, dude. He, and, at the, <laughs> and at the time, we were just doing the bookkeeping and tax work. And so he said, hey, l l I need to activate kind of the CFO consulting side of things because I'm hurting. So long story short, we helped him grow his bottom line or his take-home cash by another $20,000 per month in just 45 days. So how the heck did we get there? So in the first step, we started with analyzing his sales and marketing efforts. What was driving his sales and what were the associated costs of driving those sales? Okay, so we found that he had a large advertising budget. Uh, so we began with analyzing the return on investment um, of each of the mediums he was using in that advertising budget. Um, and very quickly, we were able to determine, golly, I want to say this is maybe like uh, 20... 15, 20 days into it, um, very quickly we were able to turn, uh, see that 15 and 20 days into it, that one of these platforms, that for every dollar he was spending, he was generating $15 in gross revenues. So it's a 15 to 1 ROI, which is ridiculously awesome. <laughs> so as you can imagine, we froze spending on each of the other platforms and reallocated all of the budget to just that one boom, we're done. That's step one. Um, second step was to analyze his other sales costs. And lo and behold, we see that, and we see this all the time, when he started the, game, the, the company, he gave a sweetheart deal to his VP of sales. His comp, the VP of sales comp was 20% of the top of of the top line of all gross revenue. So regardless of whether his team had, had even closed the deal, this gentleman was getting 20% of all top line revenue. The gentleman was actually making more cash than the owner, owner without any of the risk, without any of the expenses, nothing. So thus, our second step was then renegotiating a really a proper compensation plan that was more aligned with his sales role as the company was now. It, 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 it's super common for that to happen. We kind of make a deal at the outset, and we don't really revise it. Maybe we're not doing um, semi-annual reviews with our staff in these early days and really looking out at and beating up the numbers, and the next thing you know, we're really out of sync. Um, so these, as I said, these steps resulted in another $20,000 per month in his pocket. So, I mean, heck, how would you like to have another 20, 20K in your month uh, in your pocket. I'd love it, honestly. Um, but, you know, guess what that means is that just the sales, but analyzing sales and marketing is just the beginning of this kind of third phase. Um, we haven't even with that client um, do begin, begun to dive in the true operational structure of his operations. Um, that's going to be kind of really phase four, 3.2 of, of what we're doing with them. And there's a great book out there called EOS Traction. I'm a huge fan of this book called EOS Traction. Um, and we actually follow the framework of that, that of traction when we're consulting in this third phase of growth execution. Remember, we do all of our work within these three phases, stabilization, analysis, we we'll use those, all the data we have in those first two, two phases to now execute on, on further growth. Um, and so for all our new clients, we, also, we, we always give 
the leadership team copies of that book. Um, so then we can really all begin speaking the same language. So a lot of fun with there, a lot of fun conversations. So now that we've whipped through really the first three phases of closing out the year, rolling into the new year with steam, um, I wanted to kind of extend you know, for um, all our listeners, you know, uh, a little present. Um, so for all of our, most of our clients use QuickBooks Online. And so uh, most of our new clients use QuickBooks Online. And as I discussed, you know, the success of phase two and phase three is completely dependent on the accuracy of phase one. And so let me actually go to this next slide of our offer, a free QuickBooks Online diagnostic. Um, so if you just email me at uh, tm at fusiontaxes.com um, as soon as you can then we can uh, we can kind of coordinate uh, to have a call and talk through what a diagnostic looks like um, so with that um, I think we are pretty much good to go on discussing the kind of three phases of keeping everything together I hope you had fun um, and we will talk